Okay, good. We can get going here. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce our colloquium speaker for the day. It's uh, Professor Mohamed Hassan from the physics department. He's also a joint faculty here with us in optical sciences and also holds an appointment with um, UA Bio5 Institute for Biomedical Research. And um, he's going to tell us today about uh, the world of attosecond science, or at least his corner of it. Um, he got his PhD at the Max Planck Institute back in 2013 in a very famous group uh, where he worked on attosecond pulse generation. Uh, this was uh, in Garching, Germany, and um, the idea of generating a very broad spectrum and synthesizing a very short pulse of light is one that's sort of been out there for a while, and many people have tried, and many people have failed, uh, but uh, Professor Mohamed Hassan is the one who actually got that to work, and he's generated uh, an attosecond single cycle pulses in the visible region, in the optical region, and is actually uh, not only great science that he's going on to do with that, it's also in the Guinness Book of World Records, among other rewards, as the shortest pulse of light. Um, after that work at, uh, in Garshing, he went on and did a postdoc in uh, Ahmad Zuel's group at Caltech. Uh, as well, if you don't know, as a Nobel laureate in chemistry around 1999, maybe. And he continued to work on attosecond science as well as electron microscopy. Um, he has a number of high profile uh, publications in this work, and since he's been here, he's also been recently awarded the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation Research Investigator Award, and also recently the Air Force Young Investigator Award. So we're very happy to have him here at the University of Arizona and here today to tell us more about uh, attosecond science. Thanks. Jason, for this nice uh, introduction, and thank you all for this nice uh, invitation. And I'm happy to be here in one of the best uh, optical science schools in the nation, and also I think in the world. So uh, it's a pleasure today to present some of my research activity about the attosecond electron imaging. So the main aim of my research work is to uh, control and image the electron motion in real time and space. So, but the question raised, why the electron motion? The electron motion is in the heart, sorry, is in the heart of all phenomena in nature. So the electron is responsible for almost everything in our life. So if we take example here, I don't know if the video here is not working or not. Uh, probably it's not. Okay, it's working. <laughs> so, First of all, if you take, f for example, this uh, bulb here of light, the electron inside it is moving, oscillating in different frequencies, and this motion of electrons create or emit some photons, and the color of these photons or the color of this light, it's based on the oscillation of these electrons. Then f these photons transfer to your eye, then enters to the retina, started to excite the electrons again in the uh, molecules in this retina, and create a uh, uh, signal. This signal transfer through whole body via electron motion again to reach to your brain and form an image. So this is why electron motion and study of the electron motion is very uh, important in our life. Another example is, in chemistry, valence electron motion control the atom-atom bond. And as a consequence of that, it control the molecular structure. So the ability to control this valence electron motion will give us the possibility to control the uh, molecular structure. And this opens the door for many uh, biomedical applications and drug design, stuff like that. Finally, in electronics. So, as you know, most of the electronics up to date is based on switching on and off the current using a voltage or a microwaves works in nanosecond time scale. This is why the best or the fastest electronics we do have up to date is working in the gigahertz, right? The ability to control the electron motion in solids opens the door for establishing or for developing a light field driven electronics where the uh, data can transfer with the speed of ultra fast laser pulses in femtosecond time scale which in the beta hertz regime million times faster than the current technology so this is some of the examples why the electron motion and study of this electron motion is very important in our life 
So this view graph, for example, shows you the uh, space versus time. So the motion of molecules, atoms, and electrons. And as you can see, the ability to control and to see the atomic and, that, uh, and the molecular motion in the few hundred femtosecond time scale open a new field of femtochemistry, and this field got a Nobel Prize in 1999. Similar to that, if we take it to the next step, which is the electronic motion, happens in few hundred to few, femto, few hundred attosecond to few femtosecond time scale, and this is the uh, uh, time defined by the energy spacing between the energy states inside the system where the electron moves. So the electron motion inside atoms, molecules, and nanostructures happen in the uh, attosecond time scale, and this is open the door for establishing a new field of attosecond physics starting from, I think, the beginning of last decade. So the ability for tracing and imaging is electron motion in real time and space already have demonstrated in a very high impact in science and technology. The field starts, as I said, in the, I think, 2000, by the generation of the first attosecond XUV pulses. So as you saw in the view graph, this happens, as I said, in the attosecond time scale, and we needed a tool which has similar time uh, resolution to be able to see and study this electronic motion. And this is, was the XUV attosecond pulses generated by the high harmonic generation. And it was able to uh, study, we were able to study some electronic dynamics inside some molecules and some uh, atomic systems using this XUV photons. However, this is the two main tool has been used in this field, the attosecond field. The first tool is a few cycle balls, the typical laser balls in the visible regime, which has few uh, femtosecond balls duration. The properties of this balls, it is have an, a very low photon energy and it has an, a lot of flux or intensity, and we able to control the waveform of this pulse. Okay. However, the duration of this pulse is, as I said, two to four femtosecond. So it doesn't provide the attosecond resolution which we need unless we do the experiment in the uh, high field regime or the uh, high field interaction, where it's extremely nonlinear and only subcycle of the pulse contributed. So most of the uh, study has been done using the few cycle pulse has been done on the ionization uh, or ionized system, not the neutral system. The other tool is the XUV photons. The attosecond resolution is inherited in these pulses. However, it has an, a very high photon energy between 20 electron volt or more than that. So why we cannot use this one and study the electronic dynamics for neutral system because this high energy of the photons, which is beyond the uh, typical 10 electron volt where the system remains unionized. And I think this is hold back the attosecond field for two decades now to find the most attractive uh, applications, which I think from my point of view, the electron motion in molecules because of this reason, because the tool, the attosecond tool has a high energy. And it could be one of the reasons why the attosecond field particularly didn't get the Nobel Prize like this month, and it goes to the, uh, Moreau for his work on the laser uh, amplification because of this reason. Attosecond field doesn't up till now find the right application. And this is because of the limitation of this high field or high photon energy of the XUV photons. Okay, so the field calls for a new tool which it can combine the unique properties of the few cycle pulse, which is high power and low photon energy, so it can work for the neutral matter as well. And in the same time, 
has a resolution of the attosecond time scale. So this could open the door for using the attosecond technology in chemistry, which was not possible before. And we generate such a tool, and we call it the optical attosecond pulse, which is a laser pulse, has an attosecond resolution, as I will show you. So how we can generate this optical attosecond pulse? We, as, as uh, Jason said, we use the synthesis field uh, technology, where we generate an broadband spectrum, and we try to synthesize the field to generate this optical attosecond pulse. As a first application to prove the uniqueness of this tool, we use it to trace the nonlinear response of uh, the bound electron, and this will be the topic of the first half of this presentation. So the motivation beyond the uh, synthesis or control the electric field is the ability to control electron motion. So if you have an, uh, a synthesized field on demand, you will be able to control the electron motion with at a second resolution. And this is our goal from light field synthesis. So how is the synthesis happen? So there are many uh, techniques for pulse shaping, which has been developed over the uh, 90s and 80s from the last century. And it was all based on using an, a pulse shaper and control the phase of individual photons, stuff like that. We follow a different uh, approach, which actually has been um, uh, has been first time proposed by Theodore Hunch in 1991. He got a Nobel Prize in 2004 for frequency comp. So he is the one. He is the first one to propose this idea of controlling the light field, and it's based on generating an broadband spectrum. It spans over then more than two octaves. Then we divide divide this uh, spectral bandwidth to uh, almost equally different spectral channels. And here, this is, we call it the synthesizer apparatus. We can control the relative phases between the pulses. We can control the relative intensities between the pulses. So we can synthesize or obtain these arbitrary waveforms, which will be important again to control the field, uh, sorry, the electron motion. And let me give you one example. If we have such a field, this one here, which can control the electron motion in solid state. So for example, this will, half of the pulse cycle or this uh, half cycle uh, pulse here can trigger the electron uh, motion. And let's assume here it gives you signal of one, then zero, then another one. Then a sequence of this can give you sequence of one zero 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 ones, which could be an, a, a building block for uh, establishing light field electronics. This is one of the examples here. So the circle of the light field synthesis is closed by the ability to, cont to temporarily characterize your field. Otherwise, you cannot claim you are able to do control or synthesis of the pulse or the waveform unless you're able to image, uh, sorry, unless you're able to characterize it. So this is an, a very important uh, step to claim the ability to synthesize the field with attosecond resolution. So how we generate this broadband spectrum? We a uh, broader and a uh, femtosecond uh, laser pulse, 25 femtosecond, centered at 800 nanometer inside an holoco fiber, filled with a neon gas at pressure ar around 3 to 3.5 bars. And due to the nonlinear propagation inside the optical fiber, we able to uh, generate a super continuum from 230 nanometer up to 1,300 nanometer. So this is more than two optical octaves. The next step is to, uh, we developed such an apparatus. And the idea of this apparatus is very, very simple. So we have such an broadband spectrum coming from here. Then this broadband spectrum enters to the synthesizer. The acroic beam splitter will split this uh, part of the spectrum. And there are two other beam splitters to do the same thing. So we have four spectral channels here, at the, as you can see them. I assume you're able to see it. So the first one is from 230 to 350. Then from 350 to 500, 500 to 700, and from 700 to 1,300. So this is the four spectral channels. Then we have in, uh, implemented in the individual buses of the channels and a pairs of a chip mirrors. So this is to compress 
the pulse as possible to their Fourier limit. And this is exactly what is here. I don't think you can see it, but all of these pulses here, UV pulse, uh, deep UV, UV, visible, and uh, near IR, all of them around between 6 to 7 femtoseconds close to their, to their Fourier limit here, as proved by this frog measurement. So we combine all the channels together again using the same type of PIM splitter to out the, uh, to go uh, or to produce the synthesized field at the exit of the synthesizer. Now we have here implemented in a different type of basal stages. Sorry, we implemented many basal stages in individual uh, channel here and there, and this. Uh, Bezos stages give us a control on the relative phases in like less than 10 at a second resolution. Okay, so by controlling the relative delay between these channels, we can change the obtained waveform. Also, we do have other uh, dope inside the synthesizer which we can use, which is here. Uh, and a filter or an iris which can control the relative intensities as well not only the relative delays. So, to close, as I said, the circle, we go to the third step, which is uh, characterization. And we do the characterization of the field with, from my, our point of view, the most sensitive way to do that is by doing at a second streaking. So, generate the XUV at a second pulses and use these at a second pulses to streak the field or to scan the electric field. So, we have an at a second resolution for resolving the shape of the electric field. So, how is this streaking happens? We focus our synthesized pulse into a gas jet to uh, go through the high harmonic generation. <coughs> How is the high harmonic generation process happens? So first is this pulse ionize uh, uh, the gas here. It's noble gas. Usually we use neon. So it's ionized uh, uh, the atoms. So then the uh, wave packet is accelerated by the second half of the pulse. Then it push far from the uh, parent atom and it's deaccelerated with the second half to recombine again and generate XUV photons. So the XUV photons is generated here and focus on another uh, sort of uh, gas jet, neon as well, to do the streaking. So what happened here, the XUV photon is uh, excites the electrons to the continuum. So that we have here a wave packet in the continuum and then we scan the IR pulse or the pulse synthesized from the laser. Then we trace the change in the uh, kinetic energy of this wave packet, which will follow exactly the shape of the electric field. And this is what we called streaking. So this is the setup. As you can see here, this is where we do the uh, high harmonic generation. Then we generate the XUV pulse here in the uh, pink, uh, no, violet. I am not good in colors. So uh, it's generated here and it's reflected by the inner mirror to the second gas jet to do the streaking and the IR pulse is propagating in collinearly with the XUV pulse and reflected from the outer mirror. So this is two mirrors, an inner one and outer one. The outer one to reflect the IR pulse or the laser pulse and the inner one to reflect only the XUV. Both of them is focused on this gas jet and this is time of flight spectrometer to trace the change in the uh, dynamics, uh, sorry, the kinetic energy of the wave packet as a function of the arriving time of the field. So from this, we can measure the streaking spectrogram, which is the wave vector of the, uh, of the measured field. Then from that, we can retrieve our field. So the resolution here, in this case, we use a 200 attosecond laser pulse, can resolve up to 120 uh, nanometer wavelengths. And the shortest wavelengths we have in our field is 230. So we are sure we able to resolve all the frequencies in our field. So how we do the synthesis? Actually, we use in a very, uh, uh, we use an algorithm for doing this, so this is like uh, automatically done. So we start first by measuring the uh, whatever the waveform coming from the synthesizer. We don't know it. Then we send it to the uh, streaking uh, apparatus. We measure the streaking spectrogram. We do the analysis. Then we have this uh, waveform. You can see here. This is the field intensity. We decompose it or analyze this waveform 
to uh, know exactly the, indi the individual waveforms of the four channels. Then we can retrieve the relative phases here. So from that, we can retrieve how much is delayed from each other. Then we do on-demand field synthesis by moving the relative channels, respect, the, f the relative phase of different channels respect to each other. So for example, here we put two channels together, delayed from the other two channels on the other side. This is a closed loop. So we send it the feedback to the basal stage inside the synthesizer. It moves, then it goes to the streaking and it measures a different field. The possibility or from the second iteration we can achieve about 90% accuracy between what we demand after two or three iteration and what we uh, measure. So I'm not exaggerating, but to a certain extent, if you draw on a field on a paper, we can send it to the algorithm and identify what is the correct uh, phase set between the channels and we can produce this field for you. This is what the people use nowadays and call it artificial intelligence, but it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's no different than that. So we can do different type of uh, waveforms based on the application. And as you can see, we can even generate such a uh, very complex waveforms. So the question is, what is the shortest pulse we can generate from the synthesizer if we superimpose all the channels together? So in fact, uh, this is the shortest pulse we can generate from the synthesizer, 1.7 femtosecond. It's not the optical attosecond pulse which I promised from the beginning. But uh, in fact, we need to play with another knob, not only the relative basis between the channels to create the shortest pulse, which is the relative intensities. So the shortest pulse can be generated if all the spectral channels have almost quasi equal spectral intensity. And this will be a half cycle uh, pulse with a uh, timber, I mean, full wave have maximum or pulse duration less than one fifth to second. And in fact, we able to measure such a, such a pulse, so we control also the relative intensities between the channels of the synthesizer, and we able to, for the first time, measure a half cycle laser pulse with a full wave have maximum of 380 at a second. So the uh, here, somebody can ask me, OK, but what about the envelope? In fact, mathematically, the envelope definition of the laser pulse less than on a cycle, it, it loses its meaning. It loses its meaning because it's less than on a cycle pulse. So this is why we uh, identify the duration based on the um, full wave have maximum of the field intensity. And if you can take a look to this field crest and the next to it, the uh, resolution is five to one. So we are eligible to do this. And even if you still insisted to use the envelope, which is physically not explain anything about the bus, because as I will show you next, the physics is explained by the field, not by the envelope. It's still, the duration is less than one fifth to second. So, this is the uh, development of the laser, uh, of the laser pulses, and the pulse duration over the years. And here, when they started to generate the XUV uh, pulses by the high harmonic generation, and I think our tool is just jump in this place. Okay, so the generation of the optical at a second pulse open. Uh, sort of excitation rods for many applications. But as a first application, we would like to prove this tool has a unique thing than the XUV pulses. So we try to trace the uh, electron, the bound electron response in the bound system, not in ionized anymore as in the case of the XUV pulses. So we ask ourselves a very, actually very basic question in science. How long it takes from the, uh, is the electron response, the nonlinear electronic response is instantaneous or the electron requires some time to be excited from the ground state to the excited state. And it turns out there are some delay and if this delay exists, how much this delay is. And actually this idea came from this very famous 
holy book of nonlinear optics by Robert Boyd because he is one of the few people said there are and uh, uh, some delay response of the electron and actually he is so good such he predicted that it's to be in 100 at a second time scale. So our tool could provide for now for the first time the possibility to test this statement and see if really there are delay response of electron or not. So how we do that? First of all, instead of going to the lab in the normal way and do the data analysis later and the calculation, we did the opposite. So since we have the privilege of measuring the electric field in the same point where we do the experiment, so we know exactly what field we use for doing the experiment from the streaking uh, measurement. So we use our electric field as an input. Then we calculate the instantaneous nonlinear dipole by using an, a, a two-level system it describes a Krypton atom. Then we figure out that the uh, instantaneous dipole, as expected, doesn't have any delay response, which something is expected. Now, we use our measured electric field as an input, and we calculated the delay response, uh, sorry, the nonlinear uh, dipole using a time-dependent Schrodinger equation. 3D time-dependent Schrodinger equation. I'm not sure it's in, but most of the uh, details about this code is exist in this reference, if you would like to go back to it. And this measurement shows clearly the nonlinear dipole has an, a delay of 45 or 48 out of seconds from the TDC calculation. Then, okay, let's do this with different intensity. And this is exactly what we have done here. So uh, this is the field again, this is an instantaneous uh, polarization square. This is why it's different than the previous uh, slide. And at 14 to 13, so we choose exact intensity in the TDS calculation, and it turns out to be 48 at a second as we showed before. But when we uh, do it as a, at a higher intensity, but make sure less than the ionization intensity, the delay response increases. And this makes sense because by increasing the driver field intensity, you uh, alter the phase of the excitation, okay? And also the stark shift effect plays a role in this delay response. So we ask ourselves how we can probe this uh, nonlinear response of electrons. And what you can see here is a TDSE calculation blotted with the field, the driver field. Okay, a different global phase of the laser pulse. So we have the laser pulse, we change the global phase or the phase of the pulse. We call it global because it's broadband spectrum. So, and we calculate the corresponding nonlinear dipole. And as you can see, we can see clearly change in the delay uh, response. And this is calculated from the TDSE. And what you see here is just as a Fourier limit of uh, different spectrum at different global phase from minus 1.2 by to 1.2 by of the pulse. And this is the expected uh, emitted VUV spectrogram from 5.5 to 8 electron volt. So we went to the lab. We use our optical at a second tool. We focus it in a uh, uh, Krypton gas atom, uh, quasi static, at 80 millibar. And we um, Tray or we uh, sort of probe the uh, nonlinear response dynamics by measuring the VUV uh, spectrum emitted from here by using a VUV spectrometer downstream the, uh, the setup. And we make sure we keep the intensity of the, our driver laser balls less than the uh, ionization threshold of Krypton atom, which we approved by using the TDSE calculation. So this is the TDSE calculation. And this is uh, a ground state depletion. So we sure up to this 10 to 13, we don't have an ionization, but we did the experiment between 4 to 8, 10 to 13. So this is the VUV spectrum, which we measure. And it's, as you can see, it spans from 5.5 to 8.5. It's almost continuous. Then it has a district peaks line exactly in the same position of the excited peaks of the Krypton atom. This is here. And this is the line out spectrum at zero global phase. 
So this is uh, a second line out at pi over two driver field. So you see the big difference between the spectrum at different setting of the global phase. So this huge modulation of the emitted VUV spectrum shows the ability of controlling the uh, induced nonlinear dipole by using the optical attosecond pulses. To prove that, this statement, it's easy, always easy to, well, it's not easy. It's hard to measure something, but uh, what is the most difficult to prove it by just scramble it or make it disappear. And this is exactly what we try to do in the uh, confirmation measurement by using not optical at a second pulse, but two femtosecond laser pulses. And we repeat the same measurement again. And as you can see, the VUV emitted spectrum doesn't have any modulation and doesn't change by changing the global phase, which proves we need the optical attosecond pulse to control and to probe this uh, nonlinear delay response of the electron motion. So to uh, explain this in the uh, multi-photon excitation uh, sort of picture, we set up a very simple model which uh, express the uh, induced nonlinear dipole by the third order process, fifth order process, and a delay coming from the fifth order process. Why? Because if you can take a look to this uh, multi-photon excitation picture, it has an uh, infinite possibilities, but we choose only the ones which is, includes the third and fifth order. And as you can see, all the third order process emitted photons contributed up to less than 10 electron volt in this area. But also the fifth order uh, process it's delayed because it is in an instantaneous part and the non-instantaneous part of the spectrum. So this is why we added this uh, term represented the delay response for the fifth order uh, process. How we can prove the, uh, uh, the symbol model is correct. Uh, we, did, we have the TDSE powerful uh, calculation before. We went back to the TDSE calculation and we tried to fit this spectrogram using the sample model. And then we retrieve the uh, induced dipole from the TDSE, we know it, at different global phases, by zero and by over two. Then we compare it with uh, uh, fitted, with uh, retrieved induced dipole from the fitted spectrogram. And this is the degree of agreement between all, both of them. And this makes us confident that we can use this uh, fitting algorithm to fit our experimental data. And this is what we did here. So this is a measured exp experimentally spectrogram, and this is a fitted one. And as you can see from the retrieved uh, induced dipole from here, it's in the range of 45 at a second, similar or in a good agreement with the TDSE calculation. And we measure also the spectrogram at different intensities. And also this shows an increase in the delay response similar to what we have from the TDC calculation. So this experiment demonstrate that the ability of using the optical attosecond balls to control the bound electron and we able for the first time to have an access to the delay response of this electron bound electron which is in the order of 100 attosecond. So this is the first part of the talk. I think I still have like how much? 20 minutes? Okay, so this is, was actually very exciting to be able to reach to this resolution and study the electronic motion in this time domain. But in one of the discussion with, uh, with a colleague, he said, you know what, at a second is great. At a second field physics is great. But when it comes to very fast motion of electron by spectroscopic technique, using a calibrated spectrum and based on fitting. And we talk about 100 of attosecond timber resolution or, 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 or a measurement of attosecond, 100 attosecond timber resolution, then I may have doubt. Then this is trigger me to think, what can make this guy sort of 
confident about the measurement. I am confident about my measurement, but let's, I mean, I'm trying to think about a way of making him uh, believe in this measurement. And the only way to do that, not only to retrieve the electronic motion by spectroscopic techniques, but try to image it by microscopic techniques, because seeing is believing, as all of you know. So this takes me to the second part of my journey from the spectroscopic technique to the uh, microscopic technique. Try to implement the attosecond technology in the electron spectroscope, uh, microscopy. For uh, ultimate goal is to image the real motion of electrons in real time and space and make everybody confident about that. So uh, in the beginning, I will give you an introduction about the ultra-fast electron microscopy field, which also starts in the same time when the attosecond field starts. And uh, what is the challenges or technical challenges in the ultra-fast electron microscopy, namely the timber resolution why it's restricted to few hundred of femtosecond up to now, and what is the new ways to uh, enhance this timber resolution inside the electron microscope for ultimately imaging uh, or reach to the uh, resolution of electron motion. So this is an, a, a brief history about how is the imaging experiment starts. In fact, it starts in Cairo, where I'm coming from. Uh, Long time ago, between uh, 965 to 1040, by uh, Al Hussein. I don't know if all of you guys know or not, but he's very pioneer in optic science, and he has a famous book of optics. Uh, his name in Arabic is Hassan ibn Haysan. We have, he, I mean, his first name is similar to my last name, but we are not there. I wish, but it's not the case. And uh, this is, was the first way of, or the first demonstration of the ability of imaging uh, objectives. And then the uh, discovery of the electrons and the development of uh, electron microscopy opened the way for uh, 3D construction of objectives, like and this was a huge uh, step in science because given access to the actual structure of matter. And it has an, a great sort of uh, impact in science, particularly also in biology. And recently, starting from 2000, the time uh, domain has been implemented inside the transmission electron microscope, which is a people called 4D microscope. And to not only images the structure, but images the dynamics of the structure, how the structure evolved in time. And this was based on similar uh, uh, principle of time-resolved spectroscopy uh, measurement, which is freezing the time. So in the uh, time-resolved spectroscopy uh, measurement, we use two pulses, one as a pump to trigger the dynamics of the system, and another pulse as a prop. And we measure the spectrum of the prop pulse and we measure the uh, change of the spectrum as a function of the delay time between the pump and the prop pulse. Then we can retrieve back what happened inside the system by retrieving the change that happened on the spectrum. Okay, so this is the way or this is the principle of uh, freezing the time. So not anymore depend on the detector response but depends on the uh, duration of the prop pulse. The ultra-fast electron microscope is very similar to that. The only difference between the typical transmission electron microscope and the ultra-fast electron microscope is generating an uh, ultra-fast electron pulses inside the microscope by the photo emission inside the cathode. So UV pulses is hitting the photocathode to emit ultra-fast uh, electron pulses, and this is around 100 of femtoseconds due to the uh, phase, uh, sorry, the uh, space charge effect between the electrons when it travel from the point of generation to the sample. So it has few hundred uh, of uh, femtoseconds. And they use another laser bus to trigger the dynamics, then we can record movies of the structured dynamics or the atomic and molecular motion. The, as I said, the temporal resolution is defined by the pulse duration of electron pulse. And it's so restricted because the space charge effect. 
So all the, most of the people now try to figure a way how they can improve or enhance the timber resolution inside the microscope by generating a shorter electron pulses. Unfortunately, I mean, um, there are some people work on this development, but unfortunately, the intensity of the electron is not enough. So, however, they use the RF compressor or terahertz field compression to generate 75 femtosecond or 160 femtosecond electron pulses. The intensity of this pulse is very low. So there are no clear demonstration of any ultra-fast electron imaging dynamics less than 700 or 500 femtosecond to be more accurate. And this is the one. A measurement for 130, but this is they define it by RFS, so the full wave maximum is more than 500 femtosecond, and this is uh, uh, we would say the fastest dynamics ever measured by the ultra fast imaging or ultra fast electron imaging. So, is there a way to break this limit of and generate a shorter electron pulse? Yes. And again, I use, uh, I have demonstrated this way of generating in a short electron pulses by using again the powerful laser pulse. I love lasers, so I use it everywhere. So, uh, which called the optical gating uh, in ultra fast electron microscope. The idea of the optical gating is very simple. When the electron pulse interact with the laser pulse on a nanostructure, we know they have different speed of traveling, right? But when they interact on the uh, dense structure sample, the photon speed is reduced and becomes similar to the speed of the electrons, particularly if it's actually related to uh, high energy like 200 kilo electron volt or something. So the electron pulse interact with the laser pulse and there are momentum exchange happen. So the electrode, some of the electron pulse, which you can see here, this is the uh, uh, electron energy spectrum of energy uh, electron pulse without any laser. Once the laser is present, some of these electrons is gaining photon energy or losing photon energy or multiple of photon energy. So here, as you can see, it loses one photon energy, two, three. This electron on the other side gain one, two, or three photon energy from the laser pulse. So this is the uh, electron energy when the laser pulse is exi uh, laser pulse is exist and the black one when there are no laser pulse what does that mean if i switch off the laser pulse this electron is not exist right and if i switch on back the laser pulse this electron is exist in another word this electrons which gain or lose energy is gated by the laser pulse or exist only in the presence of the laser pulse, which means it has, has similar temporal profile to the laser pulse. So this is a very simple idea. It's not complicated at all. And we can control the duration of the laser pulse easily. As I show you in the first part, we can generate up to half femtosecond uh, laser pulses, but we cannot do this with electrons because it's very hard to control the electrons. So we use this uh, principle to generate a very short electron pulses and the break the limits of the timber resolution inside the microscope. As I said, we have here an interaction between the electron and the laser. Some of the electrons gain or lose. We filter out these electrons which gain or lose uh, energy. So this uh, filtered electron or gated electron has similar timber profile to the optical pulse. And we can use another laser pulse to trigger the dynamics, and we can image this dynamics. This is what we have demonstrated before. And to, as a proof of principle, we have done this using at a 200 femtosecond uh, laser pulses. The only difference between this setup and the conventional setup of ultra-fast laser pulse, we need to implement. Uh, we needed to implement another laser pulse to gate the electrons. So this is very easy. We uh, interact with both of them. We put the optical laser balls in an overlap with the electron balls, and we filter out the electrons to measure the dynamics. And this is a, a measurement of the balls duration of the electrons coming directly from the photocathode before gating. And as you can see, it's 540 femtosecond. 
when we do the characterization of the gated pulse using the laser, there is a cross correlation measurement, okay, 280 times 0 0.7, which means it's similar to the laser pulse is 250 seconds. And this is, makes us to move to the next step, which is try to measure dynamics with these gated electrons. And we do uh, use these gated electrons to measure the phase transition inside the vanadium dioxide. So we use these gated electrons, we filter it out, and we trace the change of the intensity of this gated electron as a function of a delay between the gated electrons and the bulb balls when it's illuminating the uh, vanadium dioxide nanoparticle. Before this work, the phase transition of vanadium dioxide has been studied many times. So this is no new science. But it was very important to prove that the gated electron can be used for imaging or for tracing the dynamics. So this is the curve which we uh, had from this uh, measurement, and we have to compare it with a very known technique, which is ultra-fast electron diffraction. So we record electron diffraction in the same point, in the same condition of the, uh, we use for the previous one, and we trace the change of the intensity in the Bragg, uh, in the uh, Bragg spot number two. So this is the first phase of the uh, vanadium dioxide, monoclinic phase, and this is a triagonal when the laser bolts exist, it changes the phase of the vanadium dioxide to rutile phase, and this is minus 50, 50 second, big, uh, minus 50 picosecond, so there are no laser. So this is a monoclinic phase. When the laser is exist, this black spot disappear, one, two, three, four, and we can trace the dynamics by tracing the intensity of this black spot, which you can see it here, similar to the one we extracted from the gated electron. So this is a proof of principle. We can use a short gated electron bulbs to uh, image dynamics in real time and space. We break the limits of uh, even the duration of the pulses. As I showed you before, it was 75 fem to second, but it was enough, not enough intensity. We do the gating using an 30 fem to second laser pulse. So we add to our setup two NOBA systems to generate shorter electron ball, uh, laser pulses. And we send here 30 femtosecond visible laser balls to get the electron, and another 30 femtosecond near IR to characterize this one. And as you can see, this is the duration of the electrons, and this is the gated laser balls. We do the, based on cross correlation again, the temporal characterization of these pulses. And this is the cross correlation measurement. It's printed here in this depth. And it shows that from this, uh, so the first one here in orange, this is the duration or, or the cross correlation measurement of the electron pulse coming from the photocathode. The dip in top here, it's reflected the uh, cross correlation measurement of the gated electrons, which showed that the uh, duration of 50 femtosecond, and because again it's cross correlation measurement, that means the full wave have maximum of the electron pulse is around 30 femtosecond. So this is proofs again, we can using, use a short laser pulse to get and generate short electron pulse. Once again, we can do the uh, good thing after some work, but can you scramble? Yes, we can do that. If we have an, a very long laser pulse, talking about 110, this temporal uh, cross correlation measurement of the gated electrons also shows a broadening. So this is an, a clear control of this gated electrons. So what is the difference between these uh, gated electrons and before? By the way, this is a silver nanowire here, and this is a surface plasma field measured by the gated electron. So the electron pulse duration is the shortest pulse duration ever in the ultra-fast electron microscope. We don't have a problem with phase drifting, which is a huge problem in this field, if somebody of you knows. They're always finding a problem even in a slack or any other uh, sort of DAISY or any other uh, big national labs. They find always a problem to uh, synchronize the electron pulse, which you do the imaging, and the laser pulse, which you do triggering. Because they try to talk to between two different pulses. One is photons and one is electrons. So it's always very hard to, to synchronize both of them. But here, because we use the optical gating, we use a li another laser pulse to gate the electrons. So the discussion between 
two laser pulses and it's extremely easy to do phase locking between these two pulses and attain less than one femtosecond resolution in time jittering between these two pulses. And the intensity is so much enough. We have 10% in the 30 femtosecond from the main laser pulse coming from the uh, uh, photocathode, which is the most intense uh, generated pulse, electron pulse less than 100 femtosecond. So what is next? So can we take this to the next level? This is what we try to do here. We try to uh, combine the attosecond technology with the ultra-fast electron microscopy technology to generate for the first time the single isolated attosecond electron pulse and use it for imaging the electron motion. I think you do remember, still remember the optical attosecond pulse, and this will be our tool for getting the electron. We can do that. We can get the uh, electron by using the optical attosecond pulse, and based on our calculation, we will achieve less than one femtosecond resolution. And this is the uh, uh, calculated interaction between the electron pulse and the laser pulse. Definitely is different than before. It's not just sharp peaks as you saw before in the case of 30 femtosecond or 200 femtosecond, because this is a very broad band spectrum pulse. And this pulse will provide for us the enough resolution to image the electron motion in real time and space. And open the way for new important application of attosecond physics, which is missing currently. So the other field try to follow the same uh, idea and the same technology for generating in a very short electron pulses, but uh, in fact, they cannot do this because they use an, a, a few cycle pulses or 50 femtosecond uh, laser pulses. So in each cycle, they will get some electrons. So this will end up uh, generating in a train of uh, attosecond electron pulses, but it's not useful in time resolved measurement, as probably you know, because it's a train of pulses, it's not in a single pulse. And the only way to do this isolation, I think, to use the optical at second pulse. So just to conclude, I think I'm now good in time, right? So uh, in the second part of this talk, I explained for you what is the meaning of ultra-fast electron microscopy, giving in a brief uh, introduction. Uh, the issue of the time resolved in the electron microscope and how we able to break this limit by using a laser pulser to do optical gating of electron pulses and the demonstration of the shortest electron pulse, 30 frame to second, and how we can take the 30 frame to second uh, electron pulses to the next level to obtain the attosecond electron pulses for attosecond electron imaging in real time and space. Thank you so much.